I'm teamed up with a colleague of mine who's Jen Edmonds, who is a um, certified athletic trainer as well as a cert, uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist at Franklin High School. And together, her and I will go through um, a lot of material. So I'm going to try to jump right in and get started right now. I usually talk about the building, but I can always do that afterwards if anyone's interested. This is four month old brand new 10,000 square foot building for us so I just like love this place I can talk about it so I will not go on that tangent now I'm going to start this way so so again welcome so you're in a rehab and anyone who comes into rehab has to have goals so tonight's goals are we're gonna break down different um, we're gonna break down everything about a concussion um, if I asked five of my friends to define a concussion, I'd probably get four different answers. It, it, it's kind of a really misunderstood um, thing. And unless you go through it, you probably still will never really understand it. And if you go through it, you, you learn pretty quick about it. But, so we'll start by talking about that. I'm going to touch uh, a little bit on a post-concussive syndrome, um, which is really a concussion that just doesn't go away. It's the symptoms that just don't seem to go away. Um, and then I'm also going to touch base on second impact syndrome. Now I'm just curious, does anyone not know what second impact syndrome is? Do not know. Okay, good. It's rare. It's um, probably the worst nightmare that any, that any of us could ever experience. Um, uh, and it comes from a concussion. So I'll, I'm going to talk about that because it's an important thing to understand. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jem. And she's going to talk about concussions as it pertains to the high school athlete. She's going to talk about uh, impact testing, which is a neurocognitive kind of preseason testing, post-injury testing uh, regarding um, a concussed, with a concussed athlete. She's going to touch on school and state policies regarding concussion. She's going to talk about home care and treatment, so how to take care of the child or athlete that is now in your care that night after they may have had a concussion or they don't feel well. And then she's going to talk about um, the whole process of returning to play. So concussions are everywhere now. Um, does anyone have an idea why? I'm just curious. Why do you think concussions, concussions have been around a long time, but why do you think over like the last five or six years concussions have become more in the media? Bonus question for anybody. Take a stab at it, anybody. Technology. What was that? Well, there's, there's, been, there's been some research, and that's always been evolving. So yes, they know, we know more now about concussions, certainly, than we did 10 years ago and 15, 20 years ago. But, um, but believe it or not, it's the NFL. It's that billion dollar entertainment um, called the NFL that is actually kind of dealing with a whole, I'll say kind of concussion crisis in a way. They're trying to deal with it, and they are dealing with it, but, um, but players and retired players are coming out with some issues that have all kind of come from multiple concussions. And, and there is a little segment of that that I actually had in here originally, but I took it out because I don't want to keep you here till 11. But it is a real um, interesting topic of um, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is called CTE, which is a whole other topic. But we can touch on it if there's any questions. But tonight's all about concussions. So these two top magazines, these two um, Lacrosse and Sports Illustrated, that lacrosse magazine my daughter plays, my youngest plays, she gets that magazine. Both of these came through in my mailbox on the same day about two months ago. And this guy right there, Sports Science and Safety, it stood out to me because it, down there those small words say concussions and ACLs, or concussions, ACLs, and U.S. lacrosse. Now I've been treating ACLs, I've probably treated, you know, 500 ACL reconstructions in my rehab career. And I'm used to seeing ACLs, but to have concussions next to ACLs as being a, 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 an issue is, was caught my, you know, my attention. And then Sports Illustrated over here, even before I noticed Kate Upton was on the cover, NFL concussion discussion up on top was a very interesting long article about the NFL's dealing with um, concussions. And these three books down here to me are probably one of the best resources that I think any parent can certainly have. I know I own them. I've, I've been to the, the, all three authors, they lecture, um, they're local, um, they're always at the sports medicine symposiums that I go to, and um, they're great. And pretty much 99% of all of this material tonight that I'm talking about comes from these three individuals. But the book on the right, 
is from a Dr. Meehan from Boston Children's Hospital who just put this book out a few months ago, um, which is very good. And then this center book, this Concussions in Our Kids, has been around for about four years possibly, but is written by Dr. Cantu. And, and Dr. Cantu is probably like the godfather of concussion research. He's a neurosurgeon from Emerson Hospital. He's probably been talking about concussions for 35, 40 years. And this is all you know, coming to fruition for him because things that he's been talking about, the importance of these things, are now resonating out and, and we're talking about it tonight. Um, he's probably authored probably 300 articles and, and um, research articles on the subject. And he's, again, you see his name, you can you know, take his word for, for gospel there. And in his left-hand book, called Head Games is actually an interesting book written by a guy named uh, Chris Dewinsky, who was an ex-Harvard football player who found himself in the world of um, uh, wrestling, the fake stuff, the, you know, the, what's it called? WWF. WWF, yeah, WWF, where you have, you know, 280-pound men flying around within a quarter inch of one another, and, it's, and there's tons of concussions in that whole profession, as fake as it is. Uh, he talks about them. But then he dealt so badly with his concussions that he had over his lifetime and had a real bad bout of post-concussive syndrome that almost in his own words might have ended his life. It was a, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating dealing with, 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 again, with multiple concussions. He ended up going to Dr. Cantu and, and you know, more or less turned his life around and now he's just kind of committed his life to basically promoting uh, concussion education. So they're all excellent books. This left-hand book is a, is a good guy's book, by the way, in the holiday season. If there's a husband or something at home that wants, you want him to learn a little bit about concussions, um, that's a good book, and it talks a lot about um, its connection with the NFL, which makes it even a little more interesting. So a little nitty-gritty about concussions to start off. This, the CDC estimates 1.6 to 3.8 million sports in recreational traumatic brain injuries each year in the US. Out of that number, that massive estimated number, 75 to 85% are, th are thought to be concussions, or they, they also call them mild traumatic brain injuries, but we'll call them concussions, that's, that's the, it's the term for them, not treated in the emergency room. Okay, so those those are ending up in your house. Those are coming home to you. Those are ending up in Jen's training room and, and, and on the sports fields. And um, it, it's, a, it's a huge number. The estimated part I highlighted because concussions, and I'll get into this as we go along, concussions are a funny injury uh, in a weird way. You know, someone can sprain their ankle. It's swollen. It's black and blue. They limp around. They can't fake it. They can't hide it. A concussion is enclosed. I could have a concussion right now. I could be suffering terribly with a concussion, but you might not know it. I could lie. I could fake it. I could, you know, gut through it. And it's, it makes the injury very complicated from that way, okay? But we'll, we'll get into that. A concussion is a direct force to the head. That makes sense. We could figure that. But also, it's an indirect force to the head by way of the body. So if I get hit with a hard blow to the body, my head doesn't even come in contact with the head. My, my head can almost work as like, almost like an inverse kind of movement. So as my body goes this way, my head goes that way, and that's enough to concuss the brain right there. And there's not even a hit on the brain, or a, or a hit on the head, okay? A concussion is a functional disturbance of the brain rather than a structural disturbance. And, and I'll, I want to explain this and, picture, and have you picture this a little bit. It would be like as if all of you guys were a laptop computer, okay, and, it was your, and that, that was your brain. And when you turn on that computer, you know, we all have Windows 7 inside or Windows 8 or whatever platform we use nowadays. When you turn on that computer, you know, you can go on Internet Explorer, it pops up. You can go to YouTube, that pops up. You can go to a music video, find that music video, hit play, and watch a music video and listen to it, okay? normal working computer. You can go, you know, your spouse tells you to get off the YouTube stuff, so you go over to Microsoft Word, you open up uh, word processing, and you write a paragraph on concussions and everything that you learned, and you're typing away and everything's fine. Okay, that's a normal computer. We all, let's say we all have them. 
But if I, let's say I come over and I grab your computer, your brain, your computer, computer sounds better. If I grab it and I hold it up over here and I just kind of like whoosh it through the air like that, real fast, really quick. Don't throw it. I don't smash it against the table. That would be almost like a traumatic brain injury. That would break the computer. None of that. This is all just through the air really quick. Or, or even more importantly, and I'll get to this down the line, but I take the computer and I rotate it really fast. I just spin it like that. And I give back your computer. Now, you, you'll gladly take it back. It's fine. I didn't, and nothing is broke. Nothing is damaged. I didn't scratch it. The screen's fine. And then I say, okay, log on to your computer. And so you turn it on, it comes on, you go on Internet Explorer, that pops up. You go to that YouTube video, that comes up. And you hit play. And you see it playing, but you don't hear the sound. You know, like it doesn't, you just can't hear it. So then you go down to that little speaker and you try clicking that. And basically nothing's popping up. That little slide bar doesn't pop up and you just cannot control the sound. It's just, you're not going to hear it. It doesn't work. So then you get frustrated, you kind of get out of that, and you go over to your word processor, and you go add another paragraph to that paper you were working on. And you're typing away, but as you're typing, the space bar doesn't work, or the return doesn't work, or the P, L, and O keys don't work. But all the other keys work. You can type a word as long as it doesn't involve those keys. That's almost like that functional, that's a functional disturbance of the computer. And honestly, that's how I want you to think about how the brain concussion is. Okay, so just kind of keep that in a side thought for a second because we'll kind of come back to that. I have a few little different tangents and hopefully in the end it'll kind of make more sense. Uh, with a concussion, there's, there's absolutely no normal recovery time with each concussion. If all of us were concussed in here, there's no diagram, there's no map, no chart, there's no telling when our concussion will actually resolve. There's factors that determine that and, and there's ways of taking care of the concussion that can maybe expedite the process, which we'll talk about, but every concussion is its own fingerprint, okay? It's the brain, so though, you know, when we talk about the brain, you get, you get all kinds of different variables. 80% of concussions will clear symptoms in 7 to 10 days. Sometimes it can be 24 hours, it could be 2 days, 3 days. But statistically, and I see this everywhere, everyone agrees with it, 80%, roughly 80%, after 10 days, your concussion should be gone. Then there's the 20%, or 15 to 20%, that can take weeks, months, um, and, and frankly, it can take years. It can take a year or two. Okay? So the forces that make a concussion pretty straightforward. You have a linear force. You have a straight on force to the head that can involve like a, a, a standing still position and a sudden acceleration such as this guy here. He's running. We'll just assume that he's hit straight head on. His head flies back. Okay, so he was running, moving at a relative speed. He meets that other helmet and his head ch changes direction straight back. As he falls back on the ground, Right there, he's going to meet another force that's going to push his head farther the other way, or the reverse direction, okay? But those are linear forces. Then you add in a rotational force, and a rotational force is obviously anything that takes the brain and just, and just spins it and turns it, such as if you could picture, you know, this guy getting hit from the side, his head, being a football player, probably didn't quite happen too much like this because he's stronger at it, and we'll talk about that. It's another tangent, but would, his head may turn. Now, back in the 70s, and this is in Dr. Meehan's book, they took, they did a study, and they took 24 monkeys, poor monkeys here, but they took monkeys, and they divided them up into two groups, two, two groups of 12, and they put little helmets on their head, and they, they put a, a little force and straight on to their head, and they just pushed their heads, not lethal force, just a push, a force that just kind of pushed their head back. And they did it from the front, and they did it from the back. And none of the monkeys had a problem with it, reportedly. And then they took the other 12, and they put the helmets on them, and they put the force on the side. And they used the exact same amount of force, no stronger. But it turned the monkey's head. It gave, it gave the monkey's head a spin. And all 12 monkeys lost consciousness from that. 
And they, so they learned, they figured from that, that there had to be something with this rotational element that when the brain rotates, this, this, this loss of consciousness or a concussion can occur. So, so this is like where my rubber hits the road with, with this talk. And this is um, kind of on the basic level within the brain of how a concussion occurs. Okay, so hang with me on this one. If you don't quite, if I miss you with something, let me know. We got a small enough group, just raise your hand. Okay, but this is basically, we'll call this ugly little drawing here, a neuron in the brain. All right, one brain cell. And we got probably five billion of these. We're born with a ton, we die with a lot less, and a heavy weekend of Hollywood, you know, Holly, uh, holiday party, and we lose a few. And that's, these are the things that, that die off. But these are responsible for transferring information in our brain. All right, so a message, a, a signal starts somewhere here in the cell body and travels down this axon and goes to another part of the brain, or it, ta or it attaches onto another one of these to continue the message to where it needs to go. Okay, so I got a little movement graphic here. All right, so it's in that direction that that goes. And, and a good way of looking at it too would be like if I tied a rope on that wall over there and I took the rope and I went up and down, and you know how it gets that wave effect that looks like it's going that way? Think of it as almost like that as well, okay? But basically, if, if my wife calls me up at two o'clock in the afternoon and says, hey, Neil, you gotta stop and get some milk and bring it home after work. I'll, I'll hear that message. I need to kind of put it in my memory because I'm not going home for a few hours, right? So that has to kind of slide down a neuron and let's just say get down here to where my memory is. Okay, it's really crude neuroanatomy there, but just go with me. I'd fail in you know, neuro class right now. This is, but no one's here for that. Um, so again, so as that message comes in, the job is to get that down there, okay? So now, if we add a few more things and make it a little busier, but it's still the same cell, okay? All our brains have blood flow, normal blood flow. It needs blood flow in order for it to be healthy, all right? When you have normal blood flow, or when you have blood flow, you then have energy being delivered to the, to the cell itself. And it's that energy right there that drives everything in that cell. If you didn't have that, if you didn't have this or that, then all this dies. Okay, pretty, pretty basic there. Okay, now within the cell, within this cell, we have elements. Okay, we have sodium and potassium. And, and how that message gets from there down to there is by way of these elements kind of exchanging one another. So there's little pumps that pumps in a sodium, goes into the cell, and a potassium comes out like that, and then that creates a little action potential, shoots it down the line a little bit. Then the next sodium goes in. Oh, it's getting glitchy. Okay, I'm just gonna go through it because it doesn't want to stop. You see the point there? So the action potential just keeps forming, sodium goes in, potassium comes out, and then the action potential is there, and all of a sudden now I got in my brain, oh yeah, milk it after work, okay? So that's normal. Everyone pretty, pretty elementary there? Okay. So then we have a, now we have a concussion. And again, a concussion isn't going to wipe out your entire brain. It's going, to, it's going to wipe out, again, an element of what your brain does. So think of it as the volume on that video. Okay, the video still works. You know, my brain can do other things with a concussion, but there's a part of my brain that says, I, the sound doesn't work. It doesn't work, okay? So I get concussed, and somewhere in my brain, this is what happens. Once that force goes through, instead of the little single sodium potassium exchange thing like I just showed you, you get this mass influx of sodium and this mass efflux of potassium. And it happens real quickly. And when that occurs, it basically deems that cell like paralyzed. It just turns it on its head. It stops it. It no longer right now it's just totally all messed up. All right, so there's no action potential going on. That just occurred. Now, what happens after that, and they've 
figured this out through some research that hours after a concussion, the brain goes through this whole diminished blood flow effect. Okay, it's, it, it, it's throughout the entire brain, but it's especially in that area that this cell lives. And so if you have decreased blood flow, all right, then you have decreased amount of energy getting to that cell. And that's what happens after a concussion. Those things occur. Now you've just had this massive element exchange here. The cell is laying stationary, nothing going on there. What fixes all of this, what, what straightens out that house there, is this. All right, that energy has to work on that cell to kind of restructure it, reorganize it, get it, get its house in order, so to speak. Okay, but because of the concussion and the decreased blood flow, this is minimal. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so, so now if this energy, if this happens, and this energy actually is, has an ability to get in there and fix that, 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 those balances out, then the cell can get on with its life and start working again. But until that occurs, that cell's not gonna work. So, so and when we get into symptom, we'll talk a lot, we're gonna talk a ton more on the concussion, but there's gonna be these parts of when a concussed brain is concussed, these, these, these elements that are just finding themselves as being the problem, the sound on the video, the, the space bar on my word processor, you know, it's not the, it's not the whole thing is damaged, but an element of it is. Okay? Also, and I got a great analogy if anyone wants to hear. I don't want to spend too much time, though. I got analogies for everything. But um, there's going to be a lot of talk about resting the brain, shutting the thing down. Just, just, you know, not just a screensaver of a tropical you know, picture, but literally turning the computer off and letting it rest. Okay? Why would you do that? Well, because... If other parts of the brain are trying to do their thing, then you're, 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 leave, you're stealing the energy from this healing part of the brain, and you're still trying to, you know, watch Pretty Little Liars and text your friends and, you know, watch YouTube and do all your homework and go to class and do all those things. Yep. So when you mean rest the brain, would you like sleep or induced coma or what? Oh, yeah, no, not induced coma, although that would be, you know, there's reasons for that with the traumatic end of it, but yes, sleep, rest, just let it rest, yep. Just say if you don't feel any of that, mm -hmm. and you think it would take a longer time to mm -hmm. um, get better, can that cell die? Um, yeah, you know what, um, yeah, there's, there's a wonder, I'm going to say yes to that, because they, they, they think that they do, and they think that they do after these cells have maybe been subjected to this more than once. Okay, so I, they're not the most, they're, they're, they seem fragile from the things that I understand about them. Um, but they do get better, they do heal. But if you, if you mess around with a lot of these, then bad things can happen. And that, that is part of the research that they are learning, okay? But um, that's above, a lot of that knowledge is above my understanding of it. But I, I want to say yes to your question. Um, so, so does that, does that make sense? Yeah? I'm just wondering, is there a test that if, if the child had a concussion before, yeah. and they had a CAT scan, yeah. and they've had two or three, can they take that first CAT scan and look at the other to see if these have died? No, it's a great question though. Um, the, the functional part of these concussions are not picked up on any scanning too, that's the other thing. Um, you, it would be like looking at that computer. If someone took that computer apart, it would look normal. Everything looks normal about the computer. The sound doesn't work, but, but they can't tell that by looking at it. With a concussion, they may do a scan because if you've been hit in the head, they're looking for other things to rule out. But concussions don't show up on scans. I could be suffering from a, um, I'd say I got hit in my body. I get that inverse movement of my head. I, con I concuss my brain big time. I don't, break my, I don't break my skull. I don't have anything like that. But I have a wicked concussion. You can put me right in a scanner, MRI, CAT scan, normal. Okay. There, there's technology that is down the line of a functional MRI, they call it. And they, they, there's some 
out there technology that they're hoping that someday they can actually figure this stuff out on that type of method, but right now there's not. So, um, so, the, so again, the real important part is energy needs to get to that, but if your brain is trying to keep up with everything else that you're asking that brain to do, if I'm driving my computer, okay, the YouTube thing doesn't work, my sound doesn't work, but I'm just gonna watch video in the, with no sound at all. I'm just gonna watch video, multiple screens, going crazy. That computer is feeding energy to that process. And that little sound thing over there, it's, you know, survival of the fittest. It's not gonna tend to it as much. So then that concussed area can linger farther on. Okay, so, but Jen will talk a lot about treating of these things too, so uh, we'll get into that. Now, this little thing here, okay, let me stop it at some point, oh, not there. Okay, so I apologize for the graininess of all this, but it's a YouTube thing that I stuck on this PowerPoint, but this is just a little bit of an example of a perfect concussion. And this happened on August 18th. This is Pam Oliver. She works for Fox Sports, Fox NFL. Every Sunday she does her thing um, on the sidelines here, reporting on games. And this is in Indianapolis. Does anyone remember this? Does anyone see this? Okay, I saw this. It was a Monday morning. I'm watching TV before I go to work and it's on a Today Show and they show this. And I, and and I said to my wife, I, right away, I go, oh, oh, man, big time. She's hurting. You know, she's hurting. And, you know, my wife thinks everybody, you know, now that I just know a lot about concussion, she thinks I diagnose everyone with a concussion. But I'm like, no, that's, she's hurting. So I go off to work. They don't really say anything. They don't even comment on how she's doing, which is what I was, wanted to know. I come home from work, and on the evening news, they show the story again. And they report that she's fine, that she has said she's fine. And of course, then that's when my wife laughed at me. So, so then we go through the whole week, and I forgot about it. Um, but then, you know, I'm watching football on the weekend, and her story comes up again. And they interviewed her, or they had statements from her. And the reality, what happened to her was she got hit by this football, which I'll play. I didn't want to just, re it's in a loop. I didn't want to keep playing it. She gets hit by this football concusses her brain, felt okay enough to finish her job that day, but then that night woke up in the middle of the night with a raging headache, um, nausea, and her balance was off. Um, and she basically stayed, I don't know whether it was a hotel room or she went home, but she basically locked herself down in a dark room. She, she had an overwhelming need to sleep. She says that. You can, you, you can look it up. She states it. She just slept, slept for long hours. Um, didn't feel like doing anything else, so it was like forcing her to sleep. And she more or less put herself in lockdown mode. And, um, and then she was back the next week, or two weeks after that, I know she was back. But her story came out, and her whole white lie was just because of the businesses she's in. She didn't want to, like, she wasn't going to make a big, I mean, it was, if she made probably a story about it, it was probably going to just keep coming back to her. So she knows enough to just say, no, I'm fine but she really quietly was suffering with the whole thing. And, and so, of course, then I hear that, and then I'm like, okay, no, this is, this is what I want to capture, so I, I have it here. But I'm just going to show it to you because it's almost like the perfect concussion that I just talked about. It's a football. It's not a brick. You know, it's a football. So, but it does enough to her head where it spins her head. Now, she may or may not see it coming. I would imagine she probably felt something out of peripheral vision, which then, but then actually when that ball is coming, you can only imagine that she probably at the last second went to turn her head to kind of turn away from this object, not knowing what it is. Or if she didn't see it, the ball just blindsided her, turned her head, and caused a concussion. Okay? Let's see if it plays. Oh, it worked all day. Okay. So... Ball comes in, hits her on the side of the head, and just turns her head. And I'm sorry, it looked better. It, I mean, it looked better on uh, regular YouTube, although I don't know if you want to say it looked better. But So that's, a, that's just an example of a concussion. Okay, so a little bit of a busy page here, but basically factors that affect concussions, the occurrence of a concussion, the factors that can affect it, 
And these are taken from Dr. Cantu, uh, from a lecture that I just went to a few months ago with him, and this was up on his presentation. Number one will always be the history. Um, it'll involve the number, proximity, and severity of a concussion. So your very first concussion, if you've never had one, it's actually probably a little bit of the hardest one you'll probably have. Okay, if you have the perfect force, you're going to get a concussion no matter what. But the brain is kind of a little bit more stable. It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't, hasn't been concussed yet, and the, and the resistance is probably a little bit higher. But you have your, you have your first one, and then you're, you're, in the, you're in that concussion category. If you've had two, three, four, five concussions, your fifth one is a lot easier to get than your second one. So that's where that comes from. Proximity is just how soon did you recover from that concussion, felt better, felt normal, and then all of a sudden had another blow to the head that, that concussed you, that can make it easier for you to then have the second concussion. And then the severity. If I had a concussion that was, that I was loss of consciousness maybe say, or I had a lot of symptoms uh, 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 with the concussion and it went on for say six or seven months, so very severe concussion, um, and then I returned to my normal activity, it's felt that you have a uh, higher uh, a, a chance of having another concussion after that. You get farther away from it, it becomes a little bit better. Number two, anticipation of a, of a force. It's known that if we know the force is coming, we brace. We can brace our neck. We can stabilize our neck. And then we don't get that movement, either the linear acceleration or the rotation. And that all has to do with neck strength. And that'll play a role with preventing concussions, is how strong is this neck can it, neck, this neck be to protect that brain. So when we anticipate, we're better off. If we, un, if we don't know it's common, it's got a stronger effect. Age. Um, through research, we know, we know the kids are more vulnerable to concussions. Kids can, can, can get concussions easier than adults. And why that's thought, or why that is, is because in those cell neurons that I showed you, that ugly picture of the neuron, Around that axon, that tube, is what's called myelin. And kids don't have full myelination, myelinization of their nerve cells yet. As adults, we do. And that myelinization actually forms over the course of even becoming a teenager and even the very early 20s. Okay? And that's felt like that, that myelination is actually a, a, a protection of the nerve from a concussion uh, episode. The other thing about kids is when they're young, I'm talking like eight, nine, ten year olds, they have a disproportionately larger head on their bodies. They have small bodies and their heads are larger. And then we kind of grow into our relative body size to head, okay? So they end up being like bobbleheads, really, when they play sports. They, they, they naturally have weak necks. So you, you find any eight, nine, ten year old kid, they're going to have a weak neck, a little larger head, and, um, and that just adds to that whole bobblehead movement of the, of the, uh, of the head. And also, too, um, and I could probably say this with almost anything we talk about, studies are tough with concussions. Um, it, again, it kinda, they're, they're, they're a tough thing to, to study from because they happen, you know, they're not, you can't predict them. You know, your 9, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old kid isn't really going to be subject to a study anytime real soon when he has a concussion. High school and college age kids, they've studied more. Adults, they've studied more. But they, they, just don't, they just don't know sometimes with the younger population as to why they might be having more concussions. On the fourth one, gender. There's, I took this right from Dr. Meehan's book, basically. Um, the, the research is showing that females uh, report more severe symptoms. And also females report longer periods of symptoms. That's just what the research shows. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that uh, ath female athletes that play um, sports the same as boys, so like basketball and soccer, for example, where the rules are the same, that some of the studies show that females are having three times as many concussions in those sports as the males are having. So, so when they start asking the question, like, why that is? Is the female brain just different than the male brain as far as recovering from a, from a concussion? They, they, don't, they don't know, ultimately. They don't know the answer to that. But some of the uh, ideas as to why can also be simply that females are just more honest about their symptoms. 
okay, that they just, they, they're, they, they're better apt as saying like, look, I just got hit in the head and I, I don't feel well. Whereas culturally, you have boys that are going to try to be more stoic than that for whatever reasons, and that could always be debated. But, the, you know, there, you know I, there aren't going to be a lot of boys that might feel like they can go up to a football coach and say, coach, I have a headache. Now they can. See, this is the nice thing about this all being out there. But years ago, I don't think... You probably were going to find a gen, you would know, right? But you'll find a boy that's going to go up to the coach and say, hey, coach, I, gotta, I gotta have a headache. I mean, a coach is probably going to make that kid feel bad. And, and that's, out, that's out there. So, so that kind of skews into the whole research process with it. And then there's also a question mark about estrogen and whether that plays a role. And they just don't know. They don't, they don't know. It, they're just trying to figure out why statistically um, the, the numbers are the way that they are. Um, and then also neck strength can play a role with that too. And there have been studies that show that, um, that a female neck is not going to be as strong as a male neck. And you can, you know, you look at a football player and they got developed upper traps and, 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 and more pronounced neck muscles. They're going to be able to probably tolerate a blow to the head better than someone that doesn't have that. Okay. Um, next one is hydration, which I always thought was kind of an interesting one. A hydrated body has a more hydrated brain thus gives the brain a more um, shock absorption effect, okay? It's going to absorb more, more force, they feel. And then that last one, underreporting, is, 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 is a big one. Um, I can tell you for years, for years and years and years, concussions just weren't called concussions. And they've done studies on this that I always found fascinating where they'll take athletes and they'll, they'll say, a professional athlete, a 42-year-old professional athlete, how many concussions have you had? And they'll, they'll go, and they may say none, or they may say one, or they, you know, they, don't, they, they just keep the number down really low because they're just answering the question you know, honestly. But then the, the researcher or the physician goes, well, how many times have you been hit and you weren't sure where you were for a few minutes? Or how many times have you been hit and you became ill? for days after, or that, you know, the headache that went on for three weeks, and all of them were like, oh, that happens all the time, I do that all the time. And those are basically concussions, those were concussions. And that's what's showing up now with these athletes that have played football forever, and the concussion policy wasn't quite that it was like it is now, that the NFL is working on to try to improve. These guys just played, and I mean, I go back to my high school football days, that I, I mean, I had teammates that I just remember them saying, oh, I, I, I have a headache. I always have a headache. And they, we always thought it was a helmet was too tight, you know. But, you know, who, who knows? I mean, you know, you know who, they could have been suffering from a concussion. And believe me, there's been many concussions where life has gone on. They've played. They've played. They've gotten through. None of the bad things have happened that I will get to. But they were, in a way, kind of lucky. Um, so, again, afraid to report. And then also take, afraid to be taken out of play. Because right now they're going to be taken out, you know. So... Um, so, that, so it, to protect them, and so there's a there's a whole there's a whole honesty thing too that 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 needs to continue uh, in order to keep kids uh, safe. But then again, sometimes that can work against the, the process of that kid because if he knows he's not going to play, then he might not say much. Bad habit. We got to change. So a little bit on post-concussive syndrome. I don't want to go. This is a complicated thing. Um, I didn't want to make a lot of. Uh, talk on this because it, it is a high level of, of concussion care that's beyond the scope of this talk. But, but again, approximately 15 to 20 percent of concussions fall into this category. Um, in a way, you know how I talked about that energy getting to the concussion, about not allowing that concussion to heal? If you, do, if you keep driving that computer and you keep working that brain, they feel like you can fall closer into this category, okay? If you rest the brain, if you take care of all the precautions that, again, Jen will go over, it increases your chances of losing the concussion and never, never touching the, this uh, post-concussive syndrome. But there is a percentage that people just fall into that no matter what. When you're in this, you pretty much are involved with your physician. The physician will manage your ongoing symptoms. It could be a team that you're part of that's working with. There's concussion clinics out there. They'll help manage school accommodations. And again, Jen's going to talk about all that. And I just took this right out of Dr. Cantu's book. And basically, he quotes, as disastrous as post-concussion as post syndrome is for young people, the ordeal passes, and they do eventually recover. You will get better from it, which is nice to 
hear him say that. So I just have an example right out of his book that is a post-concussion story. And I put this in here just because I think it's very relative. And I think this is so easy to be a part of this story here um, with athletes in your house. But basically, it was a high school volleyball player. Her name is in his book. It's a true story. She's somewhere in Massachusetts. But a high school volleyball player was hit in the back of the head with a ball during a game. So she was up by the net, service behind her, ball was hit, hit her in the back of the head. She didn't know it was coming. She reported after the fact that she felt dazed for a few seconds, but she finished the game. Everyone saw it. I don't know if there was a trainer involvement, but the point I was getting from the way the story was being discussed was it wasn't anything big. She got hit in the back of the head. She didn't fall. She didn't cry. She didn't look. She didn't, she might have felt dazed, but she didn't look like, oh, like this. You know, she just went on. And no one gave it any thought at all about what happened. That night, she didn't feel well, and her parents thought she was coming down with strep throat because she had a really close friend that was diagnosed three days earlier with strep throat. So you can imagine, right? You can picture, right? Didn't, Mom, I don't feel well. Oh, Carol was sick or whoever. So she was, sapped of, she was sapped of energy, and her head continued to hurt throughout that week. Still, you know, strep throat. I don't know if she, I'm assuming she got tested. I think she did, obviously, but a sickness can go on. Her mother encouraged her to continue playing and going to school, although both activities would always make her worse, many times being dismissed with vice gripping headaches and feeling in a daze most of the time. Now, that might seem like, okay, wow, why, you know, why are you sending her back to school and all that? But you just jump into a role of a parent, you know? I mean, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't know. She, you don't know how much she's complaining. You know she's not probably, I mean, the way that's described, she's not feeling that good, but maybe she's not a big complainer. And school's important, and you're a junior in high school, and you got a 3.5, and, you know, you want to keep everything going, you know? So after several weeks of watching their daughter struggle with headaches, nausea, and uncharacteristically short temper, which is a key word, that's why I highlighted it, because it wasn't, they were not watching their daughter. They were, it was someone else. It was, at this point, it's someone else. They became concerned, and off to a specialist they went. She visited an infectious disease specialist, a pediatric, pediatric neurologist at one point, a family doctor numerous times, who ruled out mono and Lyme disease. And then four months later, after the fact, she was diagnosed with PCS, or more or less the other things were pretty much ruled out, and probably someone, because she ended up in Cantu's office, but someone probably started to say, like, okay, let's go back to the beginning, and, oh, I was hit in the head. And, yeah, you know what? It, 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 you know, I was dazed, okay? And that's where that came out. But then with strict rest, strict, strict rest, and many modifications, and ended up being 30 school days missed, but finally recovered totally. So that, to me, that's a nightmare, you know, for as a parent. Yeah. Yeah. How do they diagnose them? Is it just by yeah. it's, know, it's, observing your child that they're doing things different? Or, you know, well, I mean, go, if you go back, I mean, we, the more we know, the more we educate ourselves, and the more we learn, and the more we understand, you know, these things get picked up. Um, but history, history, and some, you know, and Jen could probably answer that better, but. But just knowing, like, what happened? What happened to you? Like, what? Take me through. Be honest. What happened? Um, you know, and uh, and then and then you work. You tease your way through it. You know, um, and also too. You know, I, I mean, I mean, I was going to start this talk out by saying, you know, I've been in, I've been a, re, I've been a therapist for twenty five years, um, treating sports medicine. Yeah, that's what I love to do. Uh, I can tell you, concussions. If, I, if someone told me 20 years ago that I'd be talking about a concussion in a lecture group, I'd be like, are you kidding me? I'd, no one would come. It'd be boring. There wouldn't be anything there. I, don't, I didn't really understand it all that well, so I'd probably that would be one of my answers. But, but that's the way a lot of it was. You know, the, you, if you went, I, I mean, I had a concussion, and the instructions I was given by the doctor was totally different than what was told now. You know, so, so you know, this is coming to light. You know, this is coming out, and, then, and more research is obviously being done. Okay, so sudden, I'm almost on the home stretch here, but sudden impact syndrome is the last thing I want to talk about. And essentially, it's, there's only been a few reported incidences, there's a few reported incidences each year, all right? And there was research that was done over a 13-year period that 
a bunch of researchers did, and they were only able to find 94 only. It's weird really saying it my way. But 94 are catastrophic injuries causing death or permanent brain injury over a 13 year period. And there's people that will say, that is tiny, that's minuscule, especially with that estimated amount of concussions that were happening with the CDC. Okay, which, okay, statistically that is probably true. But it affects players, it, it probably changes, a, a, you know, I mean, it's Jen's worst nightmare, it changes families, it changes school policies, it puts trainers in school, it changes teams, coaches, communities, players that play with the kid, kids that tackled the kid that had the problem, affects them. It, it's an it's a unbelievable ripple effect when this happens. And just to give you an example, I kind of went with this as well. These are well documented. These are out again, Cantu's book. You can YouTube every one of these individuals. They all have a story. They have a picture. It's a real person. But I want to go through a few of them because I think it just kind of speaks more than words. But in 2006, this Zachary Lindstadt was playing in a football game and he had a hit to his head and he left the game. Okay? This is in 06 now. Okay, I can tell you that was probably a lifetime ago with all the stuff we're talking about now. So some of the stuff you go, wow, how'd that happen? Oh, it happens all the time with going back into play after something like this. But being a key player, he returned in the third quarter and was seen lining up incorrectly during plays. And, and there's well-documented scenarios where even players were like, you know, the, the, the quarterback would say gibberish on the play, and then people were like, what did you just say? Because the kid was concussed and he couldn't talk right. Or, or they, line, they run to the opposite sideline. They go to the opposing team's sideline and sit on the bench, and, you know, just stuff like that. Because they, they've been cut, concussed in their brain, they don't even know where they are. At the end of the game, he was involved in a tackle because he had gone back into the game. And after the game, he was walking off the field, looked over at his father, who was on the sidelines, and said that his head was hurting to his dad. And then after that, the next thing he said was, I can't see, and then he collapsed. And he was in a coma for 30 days, and those ended up being his last words his parents would hear him say for nine months. Okay? That's one. Now, here's another example. Will, this boy, Will Benson, these are all teenagers, in 2002 was playing quarterback in his high school in Austin, Texas, was involved in a helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit, got back up and finished the game. But then for several days later, he acknowledged to everyone that he was coping with severe headaches, sat out the next game to a loss from his team, Wanting to avoid another loss, he put, on, he put his symptoms aside and took the field. And in, his fir in the first half, he was seen walking off the field, taking off his helmet and reporting to his coach that he was seeing big, big blobs. And then minutes later in the locker room, he lost consciousness. And then five days later, he died from sudden impact, from, uh, sudden impact or second impact syndrome. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's called both things. Um, and then the third... Uh, in 2001, so going way back, a Max Conrad was a high school QB in Oregon, was playing with prior concussions over the previous two weeks. One more hit to his body left him dazed. He came off to the field and reported his chin was hurting, and shortly after that he collapsed. He was three months in a coma. His family was told that he most likely would not survive, but he did. He lived through after long stays in a rehab institution and now resides in a group home for individuals with brain injuries in Salem, Oregon. Now, in Oregon, in 2009, they instituted Max's Law from him. And then in Texas, Will's Bill in 2007 was instituted. And in Washington State, Lindstadt Law in 2009 was, was instituted. And again, it was all from those three um, incidences. And as of June 18, 2013, 49 states have similar laws protecting student athletes, and Mississippi is the only one that does not. And I read that since 2009, or prior to 2009, in Washington State, they had had one of these catastrophic events each year. It's, it was documented that they did. And since 2009, they have not had any. Okay, so just to describe a little bit of it, so that we understand it a little bit better, the normal brain has constant blood flow because of what's called autoregulation. So when blood pressure increases, 
the brain arterioles constrict. So these little guys. So as these main arteries, as the blood pressure increases in them, these guys constrict to kind of regulate that pressure so that the brain is getting an equal amount of, of, um, of blood pressure. As the blood pressure decreases, then they dilate because the brain needs to get that blood. It's kind of a beautiful self-preservation uh, system. Okay. S Sudden impact syndrome is thought to disrupt autoregulation so that when blood pressure is normal or elevated, when it's elevated, instead of constricting, the arterioles are thought to relax and the blood rushes through them. So that causes an increase of pressure in the skull, causing the herniation within the brain and then thus causing the death or severe disability. Okay. So I hate to end on that note, but that's the end of mine. Sorry, Jen. So, and I want you to know, you know, like, uh, obviously, sports, like, I mean, I played it my whole life. My wife played all throughout her life. I have three kids that I would never change anything. They played sports their whole life. And all this concussion stuff, we can live with. We can, we can get through. And I, we can integrate it into a competitive sport scenario. Um, it's not a shock to anyone. Now, sometimes people will say, well, you're going to change games. You're going to change it forever, and it's not going to come back. I'd rather keep, you know, those stories at a minimum and enjoy sports like we should. So I am done. Amen. Yeah. Just a quick question. Sure. I know one of the examples you showed of an insult volleyball player, but most yeah. of them were, were football. So um, yeah. the kid plays cross football, baseball. Yeah. So, um, you know, as the different leagues buy for, you know, you know this issue, uh, are you find uh, is the research across all different sports or is it primarily focused on no, it's all sports, but a football leads the way, and Jen will get into that, but football leads the way. On the, it's those collision sports that have it. Boys lacrosse is another. Um, what's the other one? Yeah, hockey, hockey. So, you know, so they have the higher incidence of it. Um, but no, the, the, you know, they're putting a lot of research into prevention. Um, how many think helmets prevent concussions? Right, they're a good answer. They don't. So they're trying to, they're, they, they have all these devices that they're, they're, mar they're figuring out, like these impact devices that measure impact so that it can be recorded to maybe take a kid out of something before. They have uh, a hit count scenario where if there's been a, a certain amount of hits to the head, that it can be registered and, and calculated. So the research, there's a lot of research being done. I, I'm... I've read it, I've seen it, I've not read it, but I've heard of it, but I, can't, I probably can't recite all of it back. It's in their books, I know that. Um, the back part of Mian's book talks about everything that's being done and breaks down the sports. It's an outstanding reference for all that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. My name is Jen Edmonds. Um, I am the athletic trainer at Franklin High School. I know that, I don't think all of you are from Franklin, so we might have Milford, I don't know, do you have other towns you guys are? Medway, okay. Okay, so basically I'm gonna go over what I see on a regular basis, kind of, you know, from the time your child gets hit to the time that they return to school, when they go to the doctor, um, things like that nature. Um, keep in mind that this is what we do at Franklin. There are definitely policies and procedures in place at all of these other high schools because it's required by law by the state of Massachusetts. They, they just, their athletic trainers might do things a little bit differently. Same results, but just a little bit differently. So here we go. Um, I hear it all the time from the kids, some parents, even some of my coaches, even though concussions are in the media all the time, there are these certain myths that people have, these misconceptions like, oh, Trainer Jen, Joey's fine. He didn't throw up. He's okay. Like, he just, you know, he has a headache. It's not a big deal. It's not a concussion. Or he didn't get knocked out. It's fine. He just got his bell rung. Just because he didn't throw up or he didn't lose consciousness. Maybe he wasn't even hit in the head. He got tackled, got hit on the butt, you know, fell over, whiplash any of these things, or just because your symptoms don't show up right away, just because you got hit with a soccer ball in the head, and after 10 minutes, you don't have a head, you're fine. You don't, no symptoms, no nothing. Adrenaline's an amazing drug, and 
your kids are playing in the state finals, they get hit in the head with a ball. They might not feel their like concussion symptoms until the next day, two days later. So just because these things don't happen doesn't mean it's not necessarily a concussion. Neil touched on it, the basic definition of a concussion. So any type of traumatic brain injury caused by a bump, a blow, a jolt to the head that causes your brain, you know, causes to change your brain, you know, to not work correctly. Um, they can, can occur from a blow to the body that causes the head to move rapidly back and forth. Anything that's going to cause your head to jar, whether it's a cheerleader getting kicked in the face by their teammate when they're throwing a stunt or, you know, going up for a header and bumping into the other person causing your head to whip back, back and forth. Um, elbowed in the face, poked in the eye. I've seen athletes get concussions being poked in the eye. It's not something you would think about. Breaking your nose oftentimes also results in a concussion. Obviously, your first initial response is, oh, their nose is broken. You know, you'll go to the doctor, you'll be fine. And then two days later, you find out oh, you also have a concussion. So we have to manage both your nasal fracture and your concussion. Some of your major features, as I said, you know, you're direct below. Um, typically, you know, the the symptoms are short-lived, basically meaning that you're not going to, if you, you're diagnosed with a concussion, you're not really dealing with this for the rest of your life. There's no permanent brain damage. You just, you have a headache for seven to ten days or, you know, three weeks, three months, maybe a year, but eventually things will get better. Um, as Neil said, these changes, they're they're acute and they're, you know, these symptoms are they're functional disturbances, not structural ones. So your child comes in to see me, tells me he got hit in the head. I look at him, he looks fine, his pupils are fine, he's just complaining of a headache, he's dizzy, sitting in class, the lights bother him, loud noises make him want to like curl up in a little ball. He can't focus, he's not being, he can't pay attention to anything, he's just easily distracted. All he wants to do is sleep. But there's no bumps on his head. Nothing's bleeding and nothing's broken. Visually, to me, he looks okay, but to him, he feels awful. As Neil said, most concussions resolve seven to 10 days. Normally, that's, that's what I'm dealing with. I deal with the kids that get hit, you know, a week, two weeks, and then they feel fine, and then we begin their return to play. Um, sometimes it's longer. Um, Usually, they don't lose consciousness. Every once in a while, I've been at Franklin High for about seven years now, I could count on one hand the number of times I've had a kid actually lose consciousness. By the time I get to them on the field, they're conscious. Most of the time, they can't even tell me whether or not they lost consciousness. It's kind of a split second thing. So a lot of times, a concussion doesn't result in your loss of consciousness. Um, your CAT scans, your MRIs, if you go to the ER, you tell them you were hit in the head, chances are they're probably going to give you a CAT scan, they might give you an MRI, but those are going to come back normal because there's nothing structurally wrong, as Neil discussed. Um, there's no ble as long as there's no bleeding, you're, you know, there's no swelling, everything's going to be normal. And it is also common for your symptoms to be delayed. I've had a few athletes, they get hit in the head, no symptoms during the game, they come in the next day, still nothing, they feel fine, they feel great. Two days after, yeah, I really have a headache. Sitting math today, all right, we'll see how you feel tomorrow. Tomorrow, headaches, worse. And then, you know, they end up getting diagnosed with a concussion. This uh, is a little busy. <laughs> I couldn't change the colors, so it's kind of hard to tell. Um, in the seven years that I've been at Franklin, this is a representation of all the concussions that I've dealt with through the years. So. It's a lot. I, it was a total of 202. This is including this past fall. Um, I can tell you that I think in the beginning, a lot of it, the, probably the kids probably weren't reporting it. I was new. I was young. They didn't know who I was. Why were they going to tell me that their head hurt? Um, you'll notice the huge jump in, uh, let me use my little fancy pointer. 2011-12, um, I think a lot of that, so that resulted that year, we had uh, 57 concussions, reported, diagnosed concussions. Um, I think a lot of that, it might have been that we just had a lot that year. 
It was also around that time that the media started really talking about concussions. People were being bombarded with it. I think the kids started paying attention. Parents became a little bit more understanding when I would tell them on the sidelines, yeah, Johnny got hit, or Susie really doesn't feel good. She hit her head on the ground. In the past, it was more of a, he just has a headache. She'll be fine. It's no big deal. Let her play. It suddenly became, you know what? It's freshman football. It's not that important. Please don't let my kid go back in. Um, it also might have been that I had been there for you know five years at that point. The kids were comfortable. A lot of them had never had another athletic trainer other than me. So they were just more comfortable telling me how they felt. So with a concussion, it's, it, it, there's a lot of gray area. You never know when a kid may or may not tell you what's going on. Um, concussions in the fall are definitely higher, always than in the winter or the spring, simply because of the number of athletes that I have. Um, you have over 550 athletes in the fall. Um, it's just, it's crazy how many, um, you know, we've got 20 sports going. Well, 20 teams, I figure, I think it's like nine sports total, 20 teams. It's just a lot to deal with. Um, they decrease, you know, throughout the winter and the spring. Um, with your less, you know, your lower contact sports. This is the breakdown by sport. These would be your, you know, what people tend to assume are your stereotypical high concussion sports. Um, football, it was 80. Um, I think a lot of that, obviously, it's the highest collision sport. I mean, you've got football, you've got hockey, um, lacrosse, but football, definitely, you know, gets the most attention. Um, you also have three teams, and within those three teams, I probably have about 200 athletes. So with just the sheer number of athletes, you're gonna have more numbers. Um, if you look at the list, uh, we have, so in order, I know the colors are a little off, but football obviously rated the highest. Um, soccer came in second, um, girls soccer, over boys soccer, which Neil kind of touched upon. I think girls are more likely to report their symptoms. Um, they just feel more comfortable. They might be more in tune with what's going on. There's less pressure for them to, you know, not have to be better all the time. You know, they understand that it's their brain. It's kind of important. Girls, girls tend to think more about their academics and their futures. I want to be a mom. I want to work. Girls, I, I'm not, I don't want to say that, Neil, but you know, it's true. So football. Exactly, exactly. Boys tend to think more of right now. Right now, this is what's important to me. I'm 18 years old. The most important thing to me is playing high school lacrosse, maybe getting into college to play lacrosse. You know, it's not, oh, I'm looking forward to being 35 and having a job and having three kids and getting the Christmas tree. That's not what they're thinking about. So football, soccer, cheerleading. Um, which majority of their head injuries occur during practice, whereas most of the other sports, their head injuries occur during the games. Um, cheerleading, lacrosse, followed by wrestling, basketball, and surprisingly, ice hockey. So please keep in mind that this is just a representation of what occurs at Franklin. It is by no means the average throughout all high schools. It might be completely different at Medway or Milford. Um, this is just what I've seen. So. Then we come to the impact testing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with impact, if you've heard of it. I know my Franklin parents know what it is. Um, so impact testing is a tool. I don't use it to diagnose concussions. Um, it is simply a tool to help me assess where the athlete is after a concussion has been diagnosed. It stands for Immediate Post-Concussion Assessment and Cognitive Testing. It's a computerized test. Um, all of the athletes take it. I think a majority of the schools within Massachusetts are using it. Um, not all of them, but most of them. Um, it takes about 25 minutes, give or take. Uh, most high school kids take at least 30, 35. After 45 minutes, it'll stop. It'll, it'll cut you off. It'll you know, tell you you're taking too long and you're gonna have to start over. Um, it recommends that it be administered by, you know, the athletic trainer, the school nurse, the athletic director, team doctor. Um, sometimes that's difficult. So, 
you know, we do what we can. Sometimes we administer them within the computer lab. Um, recently, we started giving the athletes the information to take them at home, where we can guarantee that it's quiet. We're assuming that it's quiet, and there's nobody running around, slamming doors. They're able to focus. Um, it's suggested that you take the test every two years. When we started giving the test, we did it every two years, and we found out that there were kids that were kind of slipping through the cracks. You know, maybe they only play one sport, and you know, they decided they didn't really want to take it their senior year, and they conveniently forgot, and somehow it just kind of slipped by us. So now we make them take it every year. If you play more than one sport, you only have to take it once, unless you get hit in the head and you have a concussion, and then I make you take it again, just to get another baseline. Um, the idea behind having them take it Preseason is just to, it's called a baseline. It's just to have something to compare it to. If your child gets hit in the head, then I can test them after, and then I have a reference of this is what they are normally. This is what they are after getting hit. So that way I can tell whether or not their brain activity is back to normal, or if it's still a little bit lower, or if their reaction time is a little bit slower, or if they're having issues memorizing something. Um, that's just basically why we use the tool. We don't, after a concussion has been diagnosed, um, I don't let them take the test again until they're at least 24 hours symptom free. I know that there are other schools in the area who their team physicians want the, the athlete to take the test within 24 to 48 hours after they get hit. That's what their doctor wants. I'm not gonna disagree with their doctor. In my opinion, Sitting in front of a computer when your head is pounding, light hurts, noises affect you, and all you want to do is curl up in a ball is going to make everything worse. So the last thing I want to do is make your child feel worse than they already do by making them sit and take it, what I consider to be a difficult test. It's not easy with or without a concussion. Um, so I don't want to make it any worse for them. So I wait until they've been at least 24 hours without any symptoms. They sit and take the test. Um, what the test measures, it asks them what their symptoms are. Um, a lot of my athletes, I don't know if they're just honest kids and I love them, but they'll tell me they feel fine and then I get their test back and I see that they have a headache and that they haven't been sleeping and that light hurts them. And I'm like, what? well, what is this? Like, why are you, you know, why do we take the test if you have all these symptoms? Oh, well, I didn't know that those were things that you wanted me to tell you. Like, well, it's kind of important. It also measures your verbal and visual memory, processing speed, reaction time. Um, it's also going to test your attention span, your working memory, you know, like how you respond to things, your nonverbal problem solving, and again, your reaction time. This is very busy. I'm sorry. This is just basically, <coughs> I'm going to run through, excuse me. Um, what the test is. I actually took it before I came just to make sure I got everything accurate and I can give you the screen by screen, play by play. Um, the first part of the test is your child's basic information, their name, their sport, how old they are, their birthday, um, how many concussions they've had, whether or not they take any medication, uh, if they have any kind of learning disability or um, anything that might affect their ability to take the test. Also, you know, when their last concussion was, how many games they've missed because of the concussion, things like that. So once that's been done, and each section also gives you a practice, gives you a little practice, which is probably why it takes so long to take the test. First part is word discrimination. It'll flash 15 words on the screen, gives you like three seconds to look at the words. Man, sink, fork, really crazy, ridiculous words, and you just sit there and you watch it and then it stops, and it says, I'm gonna do it again, and you're like, okay, great, and then they sit there, man, sink, fork, same words, and then it asks you, you have to use a mouse, it asks you, was this a word, woman, and you're like, hmm, yes or no. So not only is it telling, you know, testing whether or not you cor correctly pick yes or no, which it'll immediately tell you, if I said yes, it would say incorrect, if I said no, it would say correct. It's also testing your reaction time, how quickly do you answer that question? So it goes through that and gives you all these questions. So then the next part is the design memory, which to be honest with you, I think is the hardest part. I actually failed it and I can guarantee I'm not concussed, but I didn't, I didn't do well. So it gives you a linear, a weird linear design, weird pattern. 
And it's the same with the words. It flashes those designs. You know, is this one, you know, you go through and then it asks, is this one? But the tricky part about it is sometimes they reverse it. Or they flip it over or they turn it upside down. I'm like, yeah, I remember that one. Nope, that's not how it was. It was facing the other way. So it's testing that. The X's and O's is the third part. And within this, this part, there's also a distractor. So it gets a little trickier as you go on. So the X's and O's show up on the screen. There's X's and O's all over. Kind of looks like a college playbook. You know, you feel like you should be drawing lines. And then Johnny's going to run over here, and he's going to score a touchdown, and we win the game. But it'll pick out three of them, whether it be two X's and an O, or two O's and an X, or maybe three X's. And it'll have them highlighted. And you have to look at the screen and say, OK, it was that one, that one, and that one. And then it will go blank, and it gives you your distractor and tells you put your finger on the Q and the P. And when you see a P, when you see a red circle, you're going to hit the P. When you see a blue square, you're going to hit the Q. And you have to sit there and look at the screen and go, you know, P, Q, 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 P, P, Q, P. So you're doing that. And then it goes back to the X's and O's and says, which three did we pick? Like, I think it was that one, that one, and that one. And this goes through, I think, about five times. The fourth part is the symbol matching, which gives you a line of numbers, one through nine. And then it gives a different symbol on top of them, matching up with each number. So then it'll show you the symbol. It'll be a triangle or a circle or a diamond. And you have to look at it and click which one. Is it a one? Is it a five? Is it a nine? And it goes through that about 10, 15 times. And then it takes the, the, the symbols away. And you have to remember which symbol matched up with which number. And so you go through that. The color matching shows you a box with the word red in it. And it'll either be red, green, or blue. And you click it when it's a red box around the word red. If it's a blue box and the word red is blue, then you don't click it. If it's the correct color with the correct word, then you click it and you sit there. Yes, no, yes, no. Um, and then the three letter memory also has a distractor feature to it. Um, it'll give you three letters, big blocks, like X, P, Q. And then the next screen will have numbers 1 through 25 all in a grid, all mixed up. You have to count backwards from 25 to 1 as quickly as possible. They're all over the place. I could not get to 1 to save my life. I think I got to 11. And then it would go back to the three blocks and say, what were those letters? X, P, Q. And you repeat that, I think, three or four times. And then it goes back to the words from the beginning. So you have to remember those 15 words that you saw at the beginning. And then you have to remember those 15 designs that you saw at the beginning. And after 40 minutes, your test is over. <laughs> and you want to slam your head on the table. This is what I see. Once you're at, I know it's a little far, I'm sorry. But um, this is the impact test. This is it. A real-life example of a test that I had given a couple years ago. Um, this particular athlete was a hockey player. Um, this is just, you know, the basic, this is the beginning part. How many concussions have you had? She had missed five games because of this concussion. It was her first concussion. Um, she had no other medical history, no medications, nothing. So she had taken her baseline in September. She played a fall sport and then took her Mm, fancy, her first post-injury um, at the end of January, as you see these red scores right here, she failed. I, came to, I, I found out after she took the test when I looked at it and said, dear, you did not do well. Uh, you told me you were symptom free. And then you look at this little part down here that says she has a symptom score of 10, which you'll be able to see later. Um, yeah, I lied to you. I just wanted to take the test. I wanted to get back on the ice. OK, now how do you feel? Well, yeah, I feel like crap, really, to be honest with you. I have a headache. I can't sleep. School is awful. I can't stand sitting in class. It's really difficult for me. OK, she was a freshman. I chalked it up to her not knowing any better. She didn't really know me very well. We became very close after this. <laughs> so she then waited. We waited two weeks until she was finally actually symptom free. And then you'll see her scores improved. However, this part right here, she still didn't pass. So protocol is that you wait five days. So she waited five days. I still feel great. I, I'm going to pass the test today. And she had a passing score, so she was able to then 
you know, begin her return to play protocol. This is more of the test. This is just a basic breakdown of section by section, how she did, and then a beautiful bar graph example. Um, and then here's her symptom score. She did her baseline. She did have a symptom score of four. She was tired, but what high school kid isn't tired? Um, she said she had a sensitivity to noise and she was irritable. She was a little cranky that day. But then she jumped her post-test. She was up to 10. You know, she had a headache. You know, she was dizzy. Sensitivity to light and noise. All of these things were very classic concussion symptoms. Um, our policies at Franklin um, have, in the past couple years, um, the state has been really cracking down on all the high schools. We document everything. Every time your kid gets hit, whether there's a concussion or not, if we suspect that there may possibly be a head injury, I have to write it down. We have to report it later. Yes? I don't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. The other thing is they're doing the testing, but doesn't, why is it? If, if you want a copy, if the doctor wants a copy, you can have a copy. It's your, it's your child's test. So anytime that you need a copy of it, you just let me know. You can let your child know that you want a copy, and I can print it off. I can give it to them. I can fax it to the doctor. If your child's going to a concussion clinic, we've definitely, you know, I can... Right. On like certain things on the test, like if he has a pass his memory mm -hmm. test, or you know, how do you know if they have a, they walk in without a, in, in a paper that they can't write anything down? So when they're doing that, the test and that, they're not going to remember those colors or those numbers or those. Well, they're not supposed to have a pen and paper <laughs> when they okay. do it. Well, yeah. Well, they right. Really. Well, they shouldn't. Right. No, they shouldn't be. It's strictly supposed to be memory. So what are you saying? How do I know? What do you mean? When, when if your child is cheating? Right. Well, that's the thing. That's that's the that's the horrible gray area of a concussion. I I I don't know. If your child's not being honest with me, there's only so much I can do. Um, if they're not being honest with you, then you know, shame them. Then I'm I'm not. I'm obviously not doing my job of educating them about how serious it is, because um, it's scary. As Neil touched upon, it could be really scary, and you know, it would be my worst nightmare and yours if, yeah. you know, your child was lying to all of us, and then we came to find out, you know, he was, you know, it, it's just. Yeah. No, I didn't know when you're doing it, and then I didn't know if we were supposed to get a copy. Of no, I mean, if you if you want a copy, you can. Um, we have started, in the last couple of years, we've started trying to be better about, um, you know, I've got parents emailing me back and forth. Um, I can definitely send it in an email. It's very easily sent. I, can, I have an app on my phone. The concussion test is on my phone. So anytime your kid takes it, as soon as they finish it, I can bring it up and email it to you. It's as simple as that. If your doctor wants a copy of it, a lot of times when I do send the kids to the doctor, I will give them a copy if your doctor's interested. Some pediatricians don't, they don't even know what they're looking at, but others are very interested. Um, so that is an option. No, it's fine. Yes? Is there age on certain age like age? No. No, any, I mean, it's just assuming that your child can read would be, I think, a requirement. Um, other than that, I mean, I'm only dealing primarily with the high school kids, um, but I'm sure that there are private schools that are, you know, that probably have, you know, your elementary or middle middle schools. If they have sports, they're probably testing them as well. Yeah, and I know that a lot of the concussion, the concussion clinics do, um, you know, you can call them and if you want to take a baseline test, if you have a child who's obviously not in high school or, or your high school doesn't have impact and you just want to have a baseline, you can 
you know, call up children's, and I'm sure. The level of a child, too, like you said, the child, like, you know, like eight or nine, they're not as developed as you know, those things. Yeah. So not if you have to have, like, physicians or you can't just go on and take um, No, you need a password. You need, like, a code. Every school has a different code. Okay. So that I can, when I go on, I can only see Franklin High athletes, you know, those athletes that are under our specific code. Yeah. That would be bad just because if kids could have access to that beforehand. Yeah. Oh, they'd be practicing. I mean, obviously, there's a learning curve, but. The test is trying to objectify something that is very hard to do, and in a perfect world, it's it's it wouldn't even be perfect, you know. So, you know, having your child be real honest with it, having being in a consistent environment when they do it is have to battle just making sure that that's how it's achieved, you know, and then good things can come from that. Um, Massachusetts passed their concussion law in 2010. That law requires that all athletes, coaches, parents, administrator, anybody who's dealing with a high school athlete is required to take a concussion information quiz. Um, our parents are required to sign off that they have actually taken the test we cannot 100% guarantee that all those parents are actually taking the test, um, but they are signing that they have taken it. Um, it's like a 15, 20 minute video. It asks you basic questions. It's just the, the nuts and bolts of a concussion. Like if your athlete's complaining of X, Y, and Z, what should you do? Um, from a coach's standpoint, if you know, little Christine tells you that she has a headache, and she just got hit in the head, what are you supposed to do? Obviously, you're supposed to pull her off, you're supposed to call her parents and let her know. Um, you know, let them know that you suspect that there may possibly be a concussion. Um, so these two right here, these websites have the, um, the tests. They're free, and they're not really that difficult. Um, it also, the law requires also that all athletes, you know, report any prior concussions. We need to have a clear documentation of their concussion medical history. Um, all suspected head injuries must be removed from play. So if I'm not on site, then the coaches are responsible to remove their athletes from play. Um, and then it's documented. They tell me, I write it out, or we have documents. I think they're posted on our athletic website for the parents to fill out. Um, all of these things are taking place because of scary situations like the second um, impact syndrome. And then we have a specific return to play medical clearance where your athlete needs to be cleared by myself and then a physician. Um, what happens when a head injury? I, Neil pointed out the other day we were going through our slides and he was like, why do you call it a head injury and not a concussion? A lot, we don't really like to say the word concussion a lot in my office. It kind of tends to, the kids don't really like it. Um, I tend to call it a head injury much more often than a concussion because just because your, your kid did get hit in the head doesn't necessarily mean that they do have a concussion, but it was an injury to their head. So until it's actually diagnosed as a concussion, I tend to refer to it as a head injury. Um, so. What basically happens if I suspect that your child is suffering from a head injury or possible concussion? Um, these things right here, for the most part, within the first 15 seconds, I am assessing these things. I'm checking them off my list. So if your athlete gets hit and is walking off the field, I already know that their arms and legs are moving. That's excellent. Um, you know, how's their balance? Are they swaying back and forth? Are they tripping over themselves or are they walking straight? Are they just, they're okay. Um, are they talking? Are they yelling? Are they screaming? A lot of times girls can be crying. Not necessarily all girls, some boys cry too. But um, if they're crying, then that obviously they're conscious, which is also great because I don't want to deal with your unconscious child. Um, are they looking at me? Are their pupils dilated? Are they equal? Sometimes I'll whip out my pen light, depending, is it sunny out? It's really difficult to decide, you know, to see. Um, I have to shield their eyes and then shine the pen light. Nobody ever likes that. But um, checking to see whether or not they're responding. And then I'm going to start determining their mental state. 
Are they able to answer questions? Do they know who they are? We start very easy. What's your name? Where are you? What are you doing? Like, what are you playing? What's the score? What happened? You know, if they can tell me these things, majority of the time it's, my name's Johnny, I'm at Franklin, trainer Jen, I'm fine, just let me get off the field. Um, then we'll get a little bit more specific. I might, you'll, if you've ever seen me do it, it oftentimes looks like a roadside sobriety test. You're standing on one foot, they're touching their finger to their nose. I'm gonna ask them what the alphabet is backwards, the months of the year. Sometimes I'll start from like April and ask them to go backwards. A lot of times everyone forgets October. I don't know why nobody likes Halloween, but they tend to forget October. Um, I'll assess their cranial nerves, which is often ruled out once they've been talking to me, um, but just to double check, you know, just to make sure that there's no severe swelling or any obvious, you know, brain bleeding that I would be able to tell by, you know, slurred speech, uh, their inability to move their eyes up and down or around, um, if they can't smile or stick out their tongue, um, any kind of weird numbness or tingling anywhere. I never really want to deal with that. So um, I'm assessing that, um, determining whether or not they have any kind of amnesia. So retrograde amnesia would be any events that occurred before they got hit. Do you know who scored the last goal? What did you have for breakfast this morning? What was the last period of, of school today? Or interrograde amnesia, which would be anything that happens after. Do you remember the first thing I said to you? Who picked you up off the field? You know, anything that happens within a, a, a period of time after they got hit. I'll give them words. I usually give them three words, very easy words. Um, or sometimes I'll have their own teammates give them words because that way there's three of us who are being held accountable for remembering these words. Um, and then I'll ask them to repeat those words after I say them. And then for the next five to 10 minutes, I will wait. And then I'll ask them again, what were those three words? And then another 10 minutes later, what were those three words? Um, you know, what was the play? What, what play were you running when you got hit? Who hit you? Was it your teammate? Was it someone else? Do you know his number? Um, and then I'm just going to evaluate their symptoms. How do you feel? Do you have a headache? Are you dizzy? Do you have ringing in your ears? Do you feel like you're going to throw up? There's a trash can over there. Please let me know so that you don't throw up on my shoes. Um, do you want to take a nap? Like all of these things. I just, I can't, you know, in the last part, observations from others, teammates, coaches, I can't be everywhere at the same time as your other, your athletic trainers at your other schools can't be everywhere at the same time. So. If you have to leave or, you know, if I'm covering a football game, I tend to follow the play of the game. So if your athlete's been hit, they're sitting with a teammate on the bench, I'm going to follow the rest of the game and then come back and check him in five to ten minutes. But in those five to ten minutes, what happened? You know, what, did, he, did he throw up or is he asking you the same thing over and over and over again? Um, is he acting weird? So I have to go, you know, rely on what other people see. And they might be a little bit more honest than your own child. Oh, he told me he has a headache and his head's kind of spinning around, but he told you he was fine. So you never know. Um, we'll reassess your athlete for the remainder of the game. Um, if in any way I suspect that there's a concussion, they will not return to play that particular day. Um, if their symptoms seem to remain the same and they aren't extremely serious or they improve, I will send him home to you I will either call you if you're not there and tell you about it, have you come and pick him up or her, um, or I will give them to you right there on the sidelines with home instructions, which I believe is the next slide. Um, if for any reason I am at all concerned that your child needs to be seen immediately, then I will obviously send them to the ER. Um, it's, oh, back to the last slide, but it's important for you to know that um, in regards to returning to play, only a certified athletic trainer or a physician can clear a child on the field to return to play. If there's an EMT or a paramedic there, they are not legally allowed to return your child to play. So if there's no athletic trainer or no doctor, then when in doubt, your child's going to sit out because nobody's gonna, able to clear them to return to play. Um, these are your common symptoms, which... Um, I think the media tends to hammer into everyone. 
Um, the most common ones that I see would be your headache. That's always the number one. My head hurts. It's ringing. It's pounding. Uh, dizziness is also very, very common. Um, sensitivity to light and noise. Usually light more than noise. Um, a lot of kids will end up wearing sunglasses a couple days after. Uh, blurry vision usually tends to go away within the first couple seconds to couple minutes. Um, ringing in their ears usually also goes away along with the blurry vision. Um, everything else is considered a common symptom, but not something that I see all the time. Um, also just feeling weird. Trainer Jen, I just feel, I just feel weird. I just, I don't feel right. Like, I don't feel like I'm really here. I'm kind of fuzzy. Like everything's kind of, you know, that's what I hear because high school kids are very articulate. They feel weird. Um, once I've released them home to you, um, a couple things to keep in mind. It's okay for them to eat. Let them eat, but don't, you know, shove them full of a huge plate of macaroni and cheese because chances are if they don't feel good to begin with, they're not going to feel better after that. So a light meal. If putting ice on their head makes them feel better, by all means, go ahead and do it. And it's okay to let your child sleep. It's the most important thing that they can be doing. There's no need for you to shine a pen light in their eyes. That's something fun I get to do. But you don't need to check your child's eyes unless you look at them and you see that one is completely different than the other, then obviously you're going to the ER. But you don't need to shine a light in their eyes. You don't have to wake them up every couple hours. It's not necessary. They need to rest. And they, but they don't have to stay in bed at the same time. Um, it's really important not to give them medication. Um, definitely no aspirin or ibuprofen. In the, in the horrible off chance that there is any kind of bleeding in their brain, that will only make it worse. Um, it'll increase the bleeding. But it's also better to not give them anything so that you can monitor their symptoms, whether or not they get better, or whether or not they get worse. If you're going to give them something, then you're going to mask it, and then you're going to have no idea whether or not they feel okay. If you feel it's absolutely necessary that you give them something, their headache is just killing them, and all they want to do is sleep, and it's keeping them from sleeping, Tylenol is completely appropriate. Um, you definitely don't want them driving for at least 48 hours. If any of these things start occurring, um, their headache gets unbearable, they start losing their vision, balance, they can't move their arms and legs, they start throwing up, that's a, you know, a serious thing. Um, if they lose consciousness, they're slurring their speech, they keep asking you the same question over and over again. Mom, mom, what's for dinner? Honey, you already ate. Mom, what's for dinner? You, uh, you already ate. Make sure you take them to the ER so that they can get checked out and make sure that there's nothing else going on. If they start screaming at you, that's not usually a good thing, unless they scream at you on a regular basis, and then, then it's tough to tell. But if they start acting weird, then I would take them in. When in doubt, if there's something inside you telling you that your child is just not the way that they should be, by all means, go and get them checked out. Treatments for concussion. Basically rest, both, both physical and cognitive. Um, physically, you're not doing anything. You're just hanging out. I, I feel bad for my athletes that come in who have, you know, they're suffering from their concussion for a week, two weeks, or even longer if they have post-concussion syndrome. They're so bored. They can't do anything. But sadly, that's the only thing they can do is rest. So you're not going to gym. If you're younger, you're not going to recess. You're not participating in any sports whatsoever. No weight training and no recreational activities. So if you're not competing, you're playing for your high school team, and you're also not playing on your rec team, your metro team, your club team. Um, any increase in the blood pressure, so any time you get your heart rate up and your blood pressure is going to increase, as Neil talked about, um, the pressure in your brain is going to get higher. So that's going to make your symptoms worse, and it's going to delay the healing process and make them last longer. Cognitively, as we know, our brains are always working. Even when you're sleeping, you're dreaming, you're thinking, you're constantly, you can't, there's no way to actually shut it off. So honestly, the best thing for you to do if your child's diagnosed with a concussion is keep them home from school. Don't let them go to school. Keep them out. They'll be excused. Their work will be made up. Their teachers will know. And being in school is probably the worst place for them to be. 
because the lights are horrible, the air, I mean, I know in Franklin, the air quality is horrible. People without concussions get headaches. So if you have a concussion and you're sitting in class and your teacher's droning on about God knows what, I don't know, um, your headache's gonna be pounding. You're gonna wanna put your head down. You're not paying attention anyway because you can't focus long enough. All you wanna do is go home. So don't go to school. Don't bother doing your schoolwork because that's gonna make it worse. No TV, video games, text messaging, Instagramming, face timing, whatever it is. Don't do it, no reading and don't use your computer. Um, you just need your brain to rest and allow it to recover. Um, eventually you're gonna gradually start going back to school. You can go back an hour at a time, two hours at a time, pick and choose the classes that you wanna go to, do half days. Everybody is very accommodating. It's, it's an injury. It's, you know, if you break your leg, you're gonna be on crutches, so you get let out of class before everyone else. You get an extra five to 10 minutes to get out of class, an extra five to 10 minutes to get to class. If you have a head injury, you're gonna get an extra, you know, two weeks to finish your project. You're gonna be excused from school because you have to be home. This is our return to play progression. Um, you know, it looks a little busy, but the, First stage right here is anytime you've got, you, you have your concussion, you have symptoms, so you're doing nothing. You're recovering, you complete total rest. As soon as you are symptom free, 24 hours symptom free, you come in my office, you tell me, trainer Jen, I feel great, I wanna take the test. You sit down, take the test, you pass it, awesome, you're at stage two. You get to do light aerobic activity, which basically means you get to walk or you get to maybe ride the bike a little bit maybe I'll let you jog, but that's it. You're just gonna increase your heart rate a little bit, um, but you're not gonna be lifting any weights. You're not gonna be doing anything where there's objects flying at your head or elbows or knees, no tumbling, no flipping, no nothing. Um, you make it through the day. The next day you feel great. You are at stage three. So you're gonna get more sports specific. You're gonna start running a little bit more. You're gonna be skating. You're gonna be cutting a little bit. You know, you can, maybe I'll give you a soccer ball and you can kick that. Um, but you're still just kind of adding movement. You're not doing any one-on-ones. You're not doing, you know, anything, you know, where you're going to get hit in the head. Stage four, um, you're just going to progress a little bit. Every day, you're just going to do a little bit more. Um, and then eventually, you're going to get to that full contact practice. And once you get to this point, we're going to need you to go to the doctor and get cleared. So I've cleared you to start your activity and you get to stage five, and you're on that, that full day of practice, and you're going, you're awesome, everything feels great, you can go to the doctor, and you tell the doctor, I've completed my return to play protocol, I feel awesome, I've had no symptoms, everything's great, please clear me to return to play so that I can play my game. You get cleared by the doctor, you return to your game, and everything's good. As far as the school goes, um, as soon as I suspect a possible concussion, I email everybody. I email the nurses, I email your, your child's athlete, you know, your administrator, so our vice principals, the guidance counselors who then tell their teachers, okay, so-and-so was hit in the head yesterday, we're putting him on our watch list, they call it the watch list. Um, this is what's going on, these were his symptoms. He might not be in school tomorrow, if he is, he might not, have, he might not do his homework, so please excuse him. Um, and then once it's been diagnosed, your academic accommodations are going to be made. You're going to be excused for your work, being out of school, your test taking, everything is going to be extended. Um, so we do, we try really hard to, to work with the parents and the, and the athletes to make sure that they're getting what they need and that they're able to do the resting that they need. Um, these are the... I would say the three concussion clinics that are located in Massachusetts, I'm sure there might be more. Unfortunately, Milford doesn't have one yet. Um, but when your child is suffering from post-concussion syndrome, this is where I'm gonna send them. Or if they just can't pass the impact test, they're telling me that they're symptom-free and they just can't pass, pass the test, I'm gonna refer them to a concussion clinic where they can be seen by a neurologist, where they can have their symptoms monitored, maybe if they need med you know, like medication to, to help with their symptoms. Um, they all do impact testing. We, all, we communicate back and forth. I send their you know, tests to them. They send the, the test back to me. And then once they've 
been going to the concussion clinic, that is where they ultimately get cleared from. Um, Neil touched about second impact syndrome. I just wanted to reiterate that it's scary and I don't really ever want to have to deal with it. Um, so it's important that athletes be honest and that they, you know, they're aware of what the risks are to returning to play if they do have symptoms. Um, it's just awful. So always err on the side of caution. Make sure that, you know, if they feel anything, that they're reporting it to whether it's you, me, their coach, anybody. Um, oops. All right, things to remember, because I'm almost done. We can go home and watch Carrie Underwood. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Concussions are very difficult to diagnose. I know you all have asked questions like, how do I know? How do I know if your child has a concussion? Technically, I don't really, until, unless they report it to me. I have, I have no idea, because not every hit to the head results in a concussion. If they don't tell me, then there's nothing I can really do. Young athletes are at a higher risk of sustaining concussions, and once you've had one, it's much easier for you to get another one. <clears throat> Children, teens, athletes of any age or level are very reluctant to often admit when they think they might have a concussion. Some of them are just scared. I don't want to have a concussion. You know, those NFL athletes have concussions, and look what happens to them. Like, I don't want to be in that category. They might not understand that the headache that they've had for three days actually is significant, and it's not just because their best friend is sick. It's because they got hit in the head. Um, a lot of them just want to play, and I understand that, but I often tell them, you can get it, you know, when you're 65 years old, you can get a new knee. You can, you know, have surgery done on your shoulder. You can, you know, they can, they can put replacement parts everywhere else. You can't get a new brain. You only have one. So treat it with respect, please. Um, some of them don't want to look wimpy. It's a big thing with the boys. They don't want to look wimpy. I don't want to tell coach she's going to pick on me, which is usually not the case. Um, they don't want to seem weak. There's always a big push nowadays for them to be bigger, faster, stronger. Everyone wants to be the best. They're playing five sports in one season just because they're, you know, trying to be amazing. But they just need to take care of themselves. So make sure you educate yourselves. Take that online test. It's free. And your child. And just be honest. That's all I can say. Those are my references. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Wait. <coughs> Hang on one sec. We wanted to get the sound on there, so if you could just go ahead. Oh, it's required. Here, I'll sit next to you. It's like Phil Donahue. This is my Phil, this is my Phil Donahue moment. Let me run over to you. If a child has more than two or three concussions, one or two or three, every time they have, you say they're more susceptible to getting them mm -hmm. from their first, the second, third. Is the symptoms less because they get used to it? Like, not that, like, just say one had, like, one, like, four years ago, and then one last year and one this year. One last year and this year is so close. Like, he, like, they don't get that much symptoms, but then they show it, like, weeks after. Yeah, it's, it's different. That's the thing. It's different with every kid. Um, I don't think it's like a shoulder. If you dislocate your shoulder once, it tends to hurt less every time you dislocate it. But with a concussion, because every concussion is unique. Um, it's tough to say whether or not it's, it, you know, it just might be if, if it doesn't hurt as bad or it doesn't hurt as long, they just, it might not have been as bad as the first one. It also, you know, as Neil said, it also takes a little bit more to get that first one, so it might be more significant than the second or third, but you know, I mean, the second or third is just, it could just be a little bump or a, a fall or um, it just might not be as bad. It's sports. Mm -hmm. When you have four, you cannot play anymore. It's it's different. It's usually up to your doctor. Um, oh, no, we don't. I don't think we have anything documented. Um, I've, I've sadly have athletes who have had eight. I've had athletes who have had three who have been shut down. So it just kind of depends on the individual. I think the severity of the concussion. Um, also, the age of the athlete, definitely. So there's all those factors. I can, I can just add to that. Listening to a lot of physicians over the years talk about clinically seeing these patients, 
<clears throat> after a few concussions, they realize that they're happening easier and easier. So I think like the research is going to show and does show, and they, they interpret that, you know, these people coming in for their third or fourth or fifth concussion, it, it, they're saying, Doc, I, I, it, I don't even know how this happened, you know, but I, I did get kind of, I, I got dinged and now I'm worse, you know, and, and they just know that it's, the resistance goes down a little bit with every concussion. And they've had conversations with athletes after their fourth or fifth one and taking them into account in their history and just having a, a frank talk with them and their parents saying, your child shouldn't play collision sports right now. You know, they shouldn't, they should just remove themselves from that sport. And they hate it. They admit that they don't want to go there, but they just sit them down and say, you know, your brain just doesn't recover. Like Jen said, you're not going to get this thing replaced down the line. You're going to live with the one brain, you know. Uh, relative to soccer and heading the soccer ball, mm -hmm. I mean, it's such an integral part of the game, yet it's also you're intentionally putting the brain in harm's way. Right. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I know that's, that's like hot right now as far as trying to figure out with soccer in general. And there's this whole thing that they refer to like these sub-concussive hits that aren't concussive type hits that send the brain into the concussion, but it's frequent jarring of the head. And, and some of that, and I don't, you know, again, I don't do the research. I don't want to sound like I, you know, I do it, but they say that those are things that are, that they may find out that down the line are going to cause a lot of the problems of the brain of, of having frequent, frequent jarring of the head. You know, the brain just wasn't meant to kind of go through that. And soccer falls into that. And there's a lot of professional soccer players that are having issues now. And they're just not the most public things in the world. But as this comes out, more and more things like that will show up. You know, headgear is being mm. talked about, you know, like shock absorbing headgear. I can tell you that listening to the docs that understand that very well, that are in the front of all the research, those aren't showing right now that they're, that they're making a difference. You know, um, Dr. Cantu is very big about really just trying to not allow kids, and I think it's 14 years old is what he's shooting for, to even have purposeful heading of the ball in soccer. He wants to take that away from him. He just doesn't feel like a nine-year-old um, should do it. Other f people in the concussion world are saying that use a softer ball, use a lighter ball, but learn the technique because if you don't come into the technique until you're 15 and 16, that then something bad might happen to that. So you read it and you hear it and they're all on slightly slight different, well not all, but a few different pages and we, no one really just knows, they just don't know. It's, it's just, it's gonna all maybe come out with further research down the line. Anything else? I can run over to you. No? I know, oh yeah. Just one more. You know, with the, Sit down. Well, with the football, they're finding out with the players, yeah. the ones that have passed, they, they give their brains for science. Mm -hmm. And when they look at the brains, what are they find? Like, what are they seeing? Bruising? Are they seeing little nothing? Or <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. Gosh, I, I know what you're asking. Yeah, there's, um, that's what's happening. And, and if you, you know, it's in that head games book very well. Okay, but that gets into that whole CTE and the whole brain donation scenario that that the NFL like a lot there are NFL players that are donating their brains and they're evaluating them and they're doing that at BU they do that all locally and I think there might be over 150 brains right now that are in waiting to be to be dissected and they just they they um it's it's brain degeneration. It's a specific type of brain degeneration that they honestly don't find in any other population other than they did back in the early 1900s, they found in the boxing community. They found these these old boxers, they called them punch drunk, that was the name of it, the, the, the street name of it, where these boxers at the end of their life were just uh, in a daze and they were, you know, just not well. And um, there was a researcher that did, you know, took a number of brains, like 20 so brains of these old retired boxers and found this certain presentation to their brain that had all this degeneration in it. And you, they wouldn't find it on anyone else, okay? Um, 
and then when and then it just and then it just kind of went off on its own and it was boxers so it was like they're just they're trying to give each other concussions so like no one really seemed to care too much about that population but what they're finding um and if you all remember mike webster from the pittsburgh steelers i don't know if you you know he was a huge player back in the steelers he was the first one that they were able to acquire his brain it was a it was a um uh, pathologist in Pittsburgh that happened to do his autopsy and 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 looked at his brain and found these findings and then it just went from there and it's in his book it's very fascinating so if you go down 10 years from now um, I mean even Junior Seau's brain has been evaluated and is in that bank and and you know that they know how the players have been living their lives prior to their death and they have a consistent pattern then they do the autopsy and they find that the brains have this this is way beyond a few concussions so i just want people to know that this is not two three concussions that our high school uh, athlete might have and this is um a profession of banging heads against each other and when you watch you know i watch nf as most do i watch i love the nfl i watch tons of games i mean just watch a game and just watch how their heads make contact and then just do that for 20 years and but it's their it's you know they're paid it's their life they you know there's a whole like i said a whole talk show on that but for a nine-year-old ten-year-old i think we look at it a little differently right <laughs> Girl Scout. i'm just curious do you get many elderly i know my parents are elderly they've fallen a few times i don't i don't um the ironic thing about um all of this, I mean, Jen sees it um, acutely in her world. In this facility here, it's, they don't come to me. Um, they, there could be someone that is suffering from post-concussive symptoms that is very deconditioned, that maybe has some balance issues that might end up in a rehab. Um, but other than that, they, they, you know, I don't deal with it. This is just kind of a medical um, interest of mine, you know, so all of us as rehab professionals, you know, we do so many other things, but we don't do a lot of this. Um, elderly do get them. They do get them. Um, they're not going to see Jen. They're not going to come here, but they're going to have symptoms and their doctor is probably going to work with that on that. If it's all, you know, they, the metal, other parts of the medical community will help that or work with that. 